side. We are glad that you're here with us this morning. Again, this is kind of our new normal for a while now, uh, indefinitely so it seems, but we are glad that you could be here joining us this morning. Again, it's going to look a lot like it did last week and a lot like it normally does. We're going to sing, we're going to pray, we're going to have a message, and so uh, we just want you guys right now to, to focus your minds, to strap in, to get in whatever place you need to get into to uh, worship God together with us this morning. Uh, we're, uh, we're here. We're fewer than last week due to uh, new government uh, guidelines. We're trying to keep the audience here to, to 10 people. And so uh, we're, we are working with uh, uh, not a skeleton crew. We got the, we got the A-team here and, uh, and on stage. But uh, you may not see as many people uh, as you normally saw or saw last week. But uh, we're just trying to, to follow guidelines and to stay safe. And we hope that you're doing the same out there. So what I want to do now is throw it over to Mark Hickson, our youth minister, and he's going to lead us off with a prayer. I want you to pray with me. God, we thank you for this time together, this opportunity to just come together in a digital way, um, that your church is still meeting together. Your, your followers are still worshiping you. God, thank you for the love you've given us and the opportunities that you provided for us. God, we, we pray that you please be with everyone that's sick right now. Um, ask that you heal them. Let us learn something for uh, generations to come from this. God, most of all, let us not give up hope. Let us always open up our eyes and see you. And I only see you, Lord, but hear you when you talk to us. In Christ's name, amen. 
What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. And what a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, I'm leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all of Everlasting arms, oh, oh how sweet to walk, walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting arms, and oh, oh how bright the path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, I'm leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all the laws. Oh, I'm leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. And what have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. In peace with my Lord so near, leaning on the everlasting arms. Oh, I'm leaning, 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 safe and secure from all the laws. Oh, I'm leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory And how He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Oh, victory in Jesus my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about His healing, of His cleansing power revealing. How we made the lame to walk again And cause the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit I then obeyed His blessed command And gained the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me and bought me his redeeming love He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is to Him He plunged me to victory Beneath the cleansing flood And I heard about a mansion He has built for me in glory And I heard about the street of gold Beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there the song of victory oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and brought me with his redeeming love he loved me ere i knew him To victory beneath the cleansing flood. Lord, we come before thee now. At thy feet we humbly bow. Oh, do not our suit disdain. 
Shall we seek the Lord in vain? Shall we seek the Lord in vain? Lord, on Thee our souls depend. In compassion now descend. Fill our hearts with Thy rich grace. Tune our lips to sing Thy praise. Tune our lips to sing Thy praise. And grant that all may seek and find Thee, a God supremely kind. Heal the sick, the captive free. Let us all rejoice in Thee. Let us all rejoice in Thee. Well, good morning, West Side. It's certainly good to be with you during this time of communion this morning. And as we begin our time together, I want to talk about what Jesus told His disciples uh, during the Last Supper when they were together. He told them to observe this meal in remembrance of Him. That every time they eat this, they need to remember Him. They need to remember His body that He was about to sacrifice, the blood that He was about to spill for them. Ultimately, the life that He was about to give to save them, to spare them, and ultimately us from death. And that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's an act of remembering. It's an act of us to, on a weekly basis, observe this time to remember what Jesus did to save us from death. And if you look throughout the history of the Bible, God commonly talks about His people never forgetting and always remembering certain things. And this act, particularly this act, the Lord's Supper, modeled after the Passover feast, is centered around remembering and never forgetting. So that's why it's important during these times, even when we're not physically meeting together as a family, that we take time to remember what Jesus did for us. Because if He had not done this, if He had not given up His life to save us, then we would be in a very bad spot right now. And I know that across the world, uh, you know, death and sickness is something that's very commonly being talked about right now. And it's during these times that people need Jesus the most. And it's during these times that we need to remember and never forget exactly what Jesus did for us to make it to where that death is really nothing um, compared to what it could have been if Jesus had not given His life for us. So let's take a moment right now. I'm going to say a prayer uh, over Jesus' body for the bread. And uh, let's just take these times to remember, okay? Let's pray. God, I thank You so much for Your Son and the body that He sacrificed and uh, that He gave up uh, equality with You to come to earth, uh, to live, to model a life for us, to minister to people, to heal the sick, uh, to raise the dead, and ultimately to die to save us. And so right now we remember His body, we remember that body that He gave and suffered for us, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, God told the Israelites during the Passover to sacrifice a lamb and take that lamb's blood and paint it on the doorposts of their homes so that the angel of death would pass over their house and spare their lives. And that's why the blood of Jesus is so important, because that's what is painted on our doorposts so that death passes over us. That's why the, the blood of Jesus is so important. That's why He tells us when we drink this cup to remember that blood and remember that that's the blood that saves us from the angel of death. So let's pray over Jesus' blood right now and let's pray over this cup as we take it together. God, thank You for the blood of Jesus and thank You that it covers us and spares us from the angel of death. In Jesus' name, amen. It is well, it is well, it is well with me. It is well, it is well, it is well with me. Kingdoms come and well. 
kingdoms fade, but always you remain. Ages pass and seasons change, but always you remain the same. Kingdoms come and kingdoms fade. this way. I hope that you're sitting there with your family and that you've already been talking about a Bible story and singing some songs. Now we're going to do some of our Kids for Christ things together. So we're going to start with something that we do every time in Kids for Christ. I want you to push pause on this video and as a family I want you to think of somebody who you know that you need to send love to. You can either send them an encouraging message using your parents' phone, or you could just pray for that person. So push pause and take a moment to do that now. All right, after we send love, 
we start to clap our hands in hopes that our game show friends will come to visit us. So, start clapping your hands at home and let's see if we have some visitors come to see us today. Hi there kids, it's your old pal Al Talkington with Miss Susie Silencio here. It's good to see you, we miss you kids. Welcome to Let's Talk. This week we are going to talk about words of praise and that was our word of the month last month in the month of February. That's right, we're going to review just a little bit, we're talking about words of praise. And now remember, on Let's Talk, we talk about the words that come out of our mouth and just exactly how powerful, how powerful they are to build others up or make people feel pretty sad. So before we go any further, Miss Silencio, let's go up on stage and we're going to sing our Way Your Words song. Are you ready? Sing it along with me, kids, if you know it. Here we go. Let the words that come out of my mouth and the things I think of in my heart be pleasing to you, Lord my God. Now it's time to weigh our words. That's right. Very good, kids. We talk about weighing our words, which means we think about the words that come out of our mouth before we say them. Because like I said, our words are very, very strong and powerful and they can make someone's day really bright and really happy or you can make someone's day pretty crummy and sad if you say the wrong things to them. So, we're going to talk about words of praise and words of praise, the Bible talks about using words of praise and how good it is and how great it is and how God wants us to use words of praise when we talk to Him and talk about Him. And we can use words of praise when we talk to each other. <clears throat> so right now... I want you to think at home about what words of praise you can use around your house this week. Words of praise when you're talking about your family, when you're talking about God. How can you use words of praise in your everyday life, kids? So, hit pause real quick. Talk about that with your, with your mom and your dad and your brother and your sister, your grandma and your grandpa, or whoever you're with. And think about that. Think about words of praise you can use this week. I'll give you just a second. We'll be right back. All right, now that you've talked about the way that you can use words of praise this week, we're going to talk about a verse in the Bible that talks about using words of praise. This is in Psalm chapter 13, verse 6. And you might remember it from when we talked about this last month in February. It says, I will sing the Lord's praise for He has been good to me. I want you to say that with me, okay? I will sing the Lord's praise, for He has been good to me. Very good. Let's do it one more time. I will sing the Lord's praise, for He has been good to me. Okay, now that you've said the Bible verse, now we're going to play a little game where I leave a word out, but I want to see if you can fill in the blank. Okay, now Miss Silencio is back there to help me out on the piano play a little thinking music for you, okay? So, I'm going to say the Bible verse, I will sing the Lord's praise, for He has been good to me. But I'm going to leave a word out. I want to see if you can think about what word I left out. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. I will sing the Lord's, for He has been good to me. I'll say it again. I will sing the Lord's, blank, for he has been good to me. Think about that just a little bit. Miss Silencio, give us some thinking music. I will sing the Lord blank. For he has been good to me. Think about that. Talk about it with your friends, your mom, your dad, your brothers, and your sisters. Think about it. And time's up. If you said the word praise, then you got it. Good job. I will sing the Lord's praise. For he has been good to me. Very, very good. Let's remember that Bible verse, kids. Put it in your heart. Carry it with you. It's a good Bible verse. All right, Miss Silencio, I'll tell you what we're going to do now. We're going to spin our wheel for our New Testament and our Old Testament to see what we need to sing this week. Here we go. We got the Old Testament. Very good. All right, kids. You know what we do. 
We get our marching shoes on. Are you ready? Here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. Very, very good. Good job, kids. I know you're doing that at home with us. And I tell you what, I miss seeing you. Hopefully we'll see you soon. And remember this week, use words of praise every chance you get. All right? We'll see you next time, kids. All right, friends. Well, that about wraps it up for us here in Kids for Christ. But before we go, I want us to get to take some big breaths together. Remember, those are good any time you're having a big feeling. And those happen to all of us. So I want to teach you a new one today. It's called the snake. So in the snake, you sit flat on your bottom and you put your hands on your knees and you're gonna take a big breath in. Ready, big breath. Now you're gonna let it out like the sound of a snake. Let's do that one more time. Big breath in. Let it out like a snake. Very good. I'll have a new big breath for us next week. Well, as we close, we're going to sing the song that we always sing as we go to our classes in Kids for Christ. But today, I want you to think about the words to this song. We sing the song, I've got confidence that my God is going to see me through. And I hope that that's something that you're thinking about every day as things are so different. We know that God is in control and he has got this. We don't have to worry. We can have confidence. All right, so you can start with however many fingers you wanna do. I think I'll start with all five. You ready? I've got confidence. My Lord is gonna see me through. No matter what the case may be. See you next time. Well, it's a good thing I don't have to follow that normally on a Sunday morning. That's a uh, tough act to follow, and and uh, but man, what a great message for the kiddos! I hope they enjoyed that. The story that we're about to share is a story from Scripture, and it's a good one for the kids too. In fact, for those of you who are following us on Westside Friends and Family and, and on our Westside Facebook page, you may have found that we're putting a, a lesson sheet up on the, the uh, webpage there for parents to print off and follow along. Maybe do like a Sunday morning class before our services begin online, go over the story with the kids, ask some questions, and then afterwards, you can process that with them. This story is a very applicable story and it's found in 1 Kings chapter 19. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to ask you a question just to think about at home, maybe to talk about a little bit at home. But think about a time when you were overwhelmed by fear. A time in your life, maybe it was, maybe it was when a dog was, was growling and barking at you. Maybe it was a time when someone threatened you or, or maybe it was a near miss and an accident, something along those lines. But a time when fear really seemed to take control of what you were doing and of who you are. You know, years in the future when this question is asked, some may even talk about the things that are going on in our world right now. Uh, the, the sickness that's going around that's being called a pandemic has got a lot of people feeling fear. This morning, we're gonna talk a little bit about how to deal with that fear and what it looks like in the eyes of God and to deal with it by the presence of God. I want to ask a couple questions to the gang who's with me here on stage. First of all, first question I want to ask you guys to, to respond to is, is there someone that you go to, someone that you think of when you're experiencing fear, anxiety, those things are coming up? What are some things that you do 
And people you go to, who are the people you go to when you have those kinds of things going on? Do you have someone that calms your fears? Lizzie? Uh, yeah, I would say my mom and my husband do a really good job of calming me down whenever I'm afraid or um, something bad is happening. Well, I've certainly seen your mom in action, and I, I totally agree with that. And uh, she is a great calmer. Maybe it's one of her superpowers. And uh, she does a, a great job with that. And uh, whoever you chose and, and the person that you go to, again, that person in your life that just has that calming influence is there. Well, let's, let's kind of turn that around and let's say someone comes to you and needs calming. Their, their anxiety's up. They're fearful about something. How do, you, how do you handle that? What are some ways that you bring calming to a situation? Gary, do you have a thought on that? Tim, I always encourage people to pray first and to go to the Bible and seek God's will. Yeah, I, the prayer and seeking God's will is, is one of the things that's gonna come up again and again in our lesson. The idea of, of finding God's presence. I thought of a story of a time when I was a, a child and uh, I, w- I remember I was laying in my bed in my room and I thought I could hear sounds that sounded like someone walking down the hallway in the middle of the night. And I remember being terrified, f- afraid someone had come into our house and was coming back to, to get me. And the boogeyman uh, fantasy, I guess, is what I, was, what I was dealing with. And I was terrified. And I remember that night, I was very young. I began to cry and, and I had no hope. I just thought, the, the world was gonna end right there for me. I remember my, my mom coming into my room. I knew it was her. She, she had spoken to me. And she came into my room and crawled there in bed with me, and wrapped her arms around me. And I remember at that moment that my fear melted when I had mom's presence there. I remember her comforting me, speaking words of comfort, promising me that, that she would stand between whatever was coming to get me or, or, or if something ever were to come to get me, obviously she assured that nothing was at that point, but if something were to come and get me, that she would always stand between them. They would have to go through her first. And I remember, it's, and I think this is an important point for us all to remember, that that night my fears went away, not because the noise stopped, Looking back at it now, I realize that it was probably just the creaking of an old house or maybe mice playing in the attic, I don't know. But the noises didn't stop when that happened, when mom, when mom was there. But mom's presence took my fears away. I want you to hold that, and that thought and think about that. The noise didn't go away, but her presence calmed my fears and I want, us to, to, I want us to remember as you turn to 1 Kings chapter 19 that God never promised that there wouldn't be difficult days. He never promised that there wouldn't be dark times, but he did promise that his presence would go with us every step of the way. What does that look like for the time that we're gathered in now? We'll come, we'll come to, to that later on in the lesson. But let's, let's first kind of look at the background to 1 Kings chapter 19. Last week, we talked about 1 Kings 18. That's a great passage where Elijah confronted the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. We talked about the fact that Mount Carmel was in north uh, west Israel, and it was on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, we're told that from Mount Carmel, you've got a great view of the splendor of the sea, and it's a beautiful setting. And it was that setting that God chose to reveal himself again to the people of Israel through Elijah. Elijah challenged the prophets of Baal saying, pray to your God and have him send fire on the sacrifice that you've put up here. I'm gonna set up a sacrifice. I'm gonna ask my God to respond, whichever God responds with fire is the God that is the God of Israel. You remember how that went? The prophets of Baal prayed and shouted all day to their God, Baal, and he never responded. Elijah said a prayer towards the evening, asking God to respond with fire and the fire came down from heaven. This fireball came down from heaven. And it consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the altar and everything or the water that had been poured on it. And it was an amazing sight, I'm sure, for the people back then to see. And at that point in time, the people proclaimed, the Lord is God or Yahweh is God. And they took him as their God. Elijah used the the momentum of the moment to have them take the prophets of Baal and, and have them killed. And all the prophets of Baal were killed, 450 What we're told in chapter 19, though, is unexpected. 
that after that happened, things didn't go exactly the way we thought it would go. And I got to think it didn't go exactly the way Elijah thought it would go either. In that moment, we kind of imagine, or I do anyway, that the people of Israel would have seen that huge sign from God and they would have turned to God with their whole hearts, gotten rid of their idols and chosen to follow him only. Apparently, that's not what happened. Ahab went back to the the palace where he lived with his wife Jezebel and he told Jezebel what had happened to the prophets of Baal. She was furious because she was also a prophetess of Baal. Her father had been a prophet king, yeah, a priest king of this particular uh, God, the Canaanite God. And she had served him and encouraged Israel to serve him. And when she heard that her prophets, her her underlings had all been killed, she was furious. And she made a vow and sent it to Elijah and said, May may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely. May may he make me like one of them if tomorrow you're not dead. She promised that she would kill him. She vowed that she would kill him. And interestingly enough, Elijah heard that vow and the Bible says he was terrified. He was filled with fear. Remember that overwhelming fear that we talked about a minute ago. Elijah was feeling that at this moment. And when he felt that fear, he ran to the south. Intuition would say he was running to, to the area of Judah, to maybe to Jerusalem, to go to the temple that Solomon had built that was still standing in Jerusalem at the time and pray before God there in the temple. But that's not what he did. I don't know why. Maybe he thought that Jezebel had emissaries there in Judah as well or in Jerusalem as well that, that she could reach. I, we don't know. He went to the farthest south city in Israel, Beersheba. And there he left his servant and then continued south. And if you remember back in the story of of Moses and the children of Israel, when they came from Egypt up to that area, up to the area where Judah was at that point in time, that all they had there was wilderness. And that's exactly where Elijah went. He went into the wilderness because we know the story, we think for a moment that, Israel, that, that he was going to meet with God somewhere. But we're told in the story that that's not what was happening. That Elijah went out into the wilderness. The Bible says he sat down under a, a broom bush and he prayed that God would take his life. God, just take my life, he says, because I am no better than my ancestors. And as he sat there under the tree, he fell asleep only to be nudged awake by an angel that said, listen, you need to eat. And so Elijah got up and ate. The angel had fixed bread and had some water there for him. And again, in the wilderness, those things weren't readily available. Elijah hadn't gone out there planning to survive. He'd gone out there planning to die. Again, he fell asleep and again, the angel awakened him. He said, listen, you need to eat so you can make your journey. He ate again. And then he continued his journey southward. A journey that took him over a month, 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible tells us. Until he arrived at what we're told in the New International Version was Mount Horeb. Scholars say that's probably an alternate name for Mount Sinai. You remember what happened there. Mount Sinai was the place where Moses received the law where the children of Israel gathered around in the presence of God, where God spoke to them from the mountain and gave them the 10 commandments. Sinai was known as the mountain of God. That's where Elijah ran. Elijah ran to this mountain and he was and he was there seeking God's presence. And when he sought God's presence, God showed up. It's an amazing scene up there on the up there on the mountain. And as Elijah is there, he said, on that mountain, he climbs up on top of the mountain or in, the, in a high place on the mountain and he hides himself in a cave. And in this cave, he waits for God to show himself. And God speaks to him. He says the word came from the Lord. We don't know exactly how it came from the Lord. But the word came from the Lord and says, Ezekiel, or Ezekiel Elijah, what are you doing here? And, and it may be more, I, I don't, we're not told, we don't know the inflection of God's voice in that statement. But he might've said more like, Elijah, what are you doing here? God had plans for him. God was planning to use him in a very specific way. 
And rather than do that, Elijah had run south, had run away, had left what God had given him to do and had run into the wilderness, going to Sinai, 400 miles from where he was supposed to be in order to seek God's presence. And God said, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah says, listen, they've killed all of God's prophets. I'm the only one left. Everybody's serving Baal but me. And now they're trying to kill me too. He was discouraged. Things hadn't gone according to how he had imagined it going. Israel hadn't dramatically turned to God and lifted Elijah up as his prophet. Instead, they continued to turn away. They continued to live in their sin and in their idolatry. And Elijah was discouraged and fearful. And as he stood there on the mountain of God, God speaking to him, God says, listen, I want you to go out to the mouth of the cave for I'm about to pass by. I I can't imagine what that would be like. Having God say, get ready, I'm gonna come and visit. We're gonna sit and have a chat. Elijah did, he did what God told him to do, says he was in the cave and all of a sudden a great giant wind tore through that area. It said the wind was so forceful that rocks were smashed against the mountains. Had to have been an incredible view, incredibly fearful, intimidating as God made the wind blow powerfully through the mountains. But we're told in scripture, God's not in the wind. Next came an earthquake, an earthquake that shook this entire huge mountain of God. Again, had to have been a terrifying event. But the Bible says God wasn't in the earthquake either. And then a great mighty fire swept through the mountains, burning everything in its path. Again, a terrifying, huge sign from God. But the Bible says God wasn't in the fire either. Then Elijah heard a gentle whisper. And the Bible says when he heard the whisper, he got up and went to the mouth of the cave to listen to what God had to say. The conversation they'd had before was basically repeated. Elijah, what are you doing here? Well, they've killed all the prophets. They still worship Baal. I'm the only one left. Now they want to kill me too. And God gave him his marching orders. He says, listen, I've still got things for you to do. He told him to go and make a new king in, in Aram to anoint a new king in Israel. Do the job that I've called you to do, Elijah. Go back the way you've come. Go back to where you need to go. Don't fear. Something about that presence of God, something about God being there in that moment chased away Elijah's fear. He turned and went back the way he had come and did exactly what God had told him to do. Isn't it interesting, have you ever stopped as you've read through that passage to think of the message that God was sending when he sent the wind, the earthquake, and the fire to Elijah and then showed up in a gentle whisper? Scholars say that, the, that God was, was demonstrating very forcibly in that moment that these amazing events that, that, God, that God has done in the past whether it be the the parting of the Red Sea, the, the inscribing of the Ten Commandments, speaking to his people from the mountain, great victories that were given against incredible odds were these Mount Carmel moments, these moments when the fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, big displays of God. And when the wind and the earthquake and the fire came through and God wasn't there, God's saying, I don't always do things like that. I don't always make myself obvious in ways that are big like that. Sometimes you'll find me in the small things. You'll find me in the gentle whisper. Man, that's true in our lives, isn't it? When we say prayers, we ask God to come in big ways. Heal us, bring us life, make our, make our loved ones better, bring our children back to the Lord. Heal our nation of this pestilence. Show up in a big way, God. We want the fire from heaven to come and fall on the altar and consume everything. We want all who see it to say, God, you are God. Yahweh is God. 
We want that big response. And God says, you know, a lot of times I come up in a whisper. We want Mount Carmel. He gives us Mount Horeb. When we pray, we wanna see the big things, but he says, yeah, I don't always work that way. In fact, a lot of times I don't work that way. A lot of times what you're gonna see when you're looking for Mount Carmel is Mount Horeb. Got a few more questions for our esteemed audience here. The members of our discussion group, they thought they came here to sing, but they actually came here to talk some too. Because frankly, we're in the middle of a, of a stormy moment in our world. Weird times. Things going on that, that we could have never imagined. Never seen anything like this before. There's a lot of fear. A lot of people are very fearful, especially if someone's getting sick around them or near them. You see a kind of panic that rises. And it's a storm in our time. And it's a storm that we've got to find a calm for. We've got to seek a calmness in our storm. And how are we gonna do that? I wanna ask you guys, how do you, how do you do that during this time? I'm sure all of us have felt it, right? We've all felt the, the, the rise of emotion, the, the fear when you get a phone call or someone says, hey, listen, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and get tested. I, you know, you're someone that I've been around. You feel that fear rising and you think, oh boy, here we go. What are some ways, what are th things that you've done to calm that fear, to, to claim the peace in the middle of this storm? Christina, you got a thought on that? Yeah. Um, I, I originally, when I was thinking about this question, I was thinking about um, myself and how I tend to clean and organize whenever I get really stressed out. But the more I thought about it, the more I was thinking about uh, spending time with my family, with my kids. Um, that's probably been the most helpful in staying sane and having something to focus on and to pour into, um, not just to say, stay uh, caught up in the fear and anxiety of the situation that we're in. So I think uh, especially just finding ways to spend time and to, to be present with my family um, has really been the biggest help in um, talking through what's happening with Joshua, especially our kid, he's eight, and um, just kind of seeing his perspective of it and being able to um, to break it down for him and to use it as a teachable moment because, yeah. you know, anxiety, fear, panic are yeah. all things that we're seeing and his little body is experiencing it entirely different than mine is, you yeah. know? And so getting yeah. to, to talk to him about it has been, has been a really basic way, but it's been really cool to see him kind yeah. of cope with it. We all experience it very differently. And, uh, and it's interesting to get the perspective of others and see how, how those things kind of work out with them. Staying busy, I like that kind of not, not just being idle, but staying busy and continuing to do that, contacting others, getting their perspective, all good coping skills for that. One of the ways that Elijah sought for, sought for peace during his storm was to seek God's presence. And I think that's something that, that we wanna take going forward. What does that look like to seek God's presence? I wanna ask you guys, how do you do that? When you wanna find God's presence, where do you go? How do you do that? How do you go about seeking God's presence in our day and in our time? Lee, you have a thought? I mean, for me, and it's kind of the, the story that you shared there, um, if someone is whispering, especially, I'm not as old as Gary, but the older I get, the less crisp my hearing is, right? And when someone talks quietly, I have to really lean in and, and listen. And so for me, uh, a practice that I try to stay in is getting away by myself, which is harder when you have a house full of kids and you're quarantined with them, but uh, to get away by myself to a quiet place and just spend time specifically with God alone and yeah. listen. No, yeah. Don't just spit out a hundred things, but actually spend time listening to what he might say to me. Right. So many stories in the Bible that confirm that. Not only this one with, with Elijah, but several times with Jesus and with Paul and others, just taking time to be with God alone and allowing his presence to calm our fear is a great way to, great way to do that. Um, do, you have a, do you have anything online? Yeah. What do we got coming in? 
uh, I'm sorry, Mary Reed and Cindy Jones and Sharon Dodge. So all kind of saying the same thing, just about uh, stopping and praying, um, listening and, or singing uh, praise music, just to kind of help them just reconnect with God and allow them time to settle down and, and actually try to discern God talking to them. Yeah, yeah, so. that's great answers. Last question, how then does this work? How does God's presence turn us from fear to faith? How does that work? How does it turn us from fear to faith? You guys got any thoughts on that, Christina? Um, I was gonna say that I think uh, when we're, when we're um, in the midst of fear, uh, control is what's driving us. And so trying to find control, especially in this particular time, is impossible because we are still striving to figure out how to, to manage it and how to um, take care of it and to get rid of it. And there's just not control. And um, on a personal level, uh, all we can do is release and let go and, and trust that God is going to um, deliver us from it. And I, I think the, the key there is, is releasing that control. Yeah, yeah, I, that's a fantastic answer. I think a lot of what led Israel into idolatry, in fact, was that need for control. Uh, when you have a, a they, they didn't stop believing in, in Yahweh and God. They just believed that other gods were, were around and available too. And the sense in that day was if, if, the, if your main God, the God of your nation, wasn't giving you what you wanted, there were other options. You could worship Baal, you could, you could talk to, the, to Asherah, you, you could talk to a lot of different gods and see if any one of them would give you what you want. And that's in human terms, taking control. I can control my own future. God wants us to surrender that. He wants us to surrender that concept of control and allow others to see us surrendering that to him, living in faith. I love it when people ask me, why do you do what you do? Why do you live the way you live? I had one man ask me a while back, why are you coming out to, to talk to us or to teach us? Uh, because of all that's going on, I'm surprised that you're doing that. When our faith stands out, we talked about last time, God, God stands up for us. He, stands, he, he shows himself through us. And when our faith steps out, when we step out in faith, God is there for us and he stands up. It's kind of like what happened with my mom when I was afraid and she was present with me, it chased my fears away. It didn't stop the noise, but it chased my fears away. And the same thing kind of happens to us now. In times of fear, God's presence doesn't necessarily take things away. I mean, we may pray for that. Again, we pray at this point in time for, for Mount Carmel. We would love to see God just come in a powerful way and very obviously take this, this disease, this pandemic away and stop it dead in its tracks give us the, the vaccine or, or miraculously heal everyone. Wouldn't that be incredible? It'd be amazing way our world would turn and say, many of them, well, the Lord, he is God. But it wouldn't surprise me in this situation if there are other things going on. If God isn't working in the whisper during this time, saying, just follow me. Trust that I'm doing, I'm doing things according to my will and that my purposes are will be met. You know, when we, when we don't have Mount Carmel, we have Mount Horeb. God's presence is just as active there. Again, it may not chase away the noise, but it'll chase away the fear. I'll leave you with a thought from King David. One of our favorite Psalms is the 23rd Psalm. And in that Psalm, David reminds, he says, though I walk through the valley of, of the shadow of death, though I walk through dark valleys, I'll fear no evil. For you are with me, and talking about God, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. In that we are reminded that God never promised his followers that there wouldn't be dark valleys, that there wouldn't be dark times, that we wouldn't go through struggle. But he did promise that he'll be with us the whole time, that he'll walk through those dark valleys with us and that his presence will chase away all of our fears. At this time, again, having to be a little isolated, I know finding someone to pray with you is difficult, but we'd still love to do that. 
we've been able to figure out how to use technology. Even an old guy like, I, like me is, has figured out how to use technology to stay in contact with people through different video chat uh, apps and, and uh, methods. I've been able to stay in touch with a number of people, been able to do some counseling. I've been able to pray with people over the phone. And that's, that, avail, that is certainly available to you today. And if you're watching today and have something that you would like for me or one of our leaders to pray with you about, if you would just message our website, we have people monitoring that and they would love to help you out at that point in time. Is there anything coming into our website that you wanted to share? Yeah, you know, there's just some other comments to tag on what you were saying. Um, Craig Davis mentioned how uh, sometimes it's trying to find good in times of a storm. And he mentioned a literal storm in, in Jonesboro yesterday. Yeah. And um, when there could have been so many more casualties if we weren't in the season we are right now on this yeah. kind of quarantine season. And so seeing God through those kind of things. Uh, Marcus McCormick has a lot of good, interesting things about how God you know, feed, fed Elijah in that moment. Even when uh, he didn't want to eat, right? he was falling asleep. Yeah. Um, so God's presence, um, several of them mentioning how God's presence is always there, right. um, even when we aren't looking for it. Yeah, so, yeah. A lot of good yeah. stuff. And I think it's a great point. There are certainly times in, in Scripture when God doesn't answer prayer the way that, the way that we ask him to. It's, it's almost funny. It's a, it's a little odd, but Elijah at one point in time asked God to take his life. He said, I'm no better than my ancestors, which means I'm practically dead already. I'm no better than my ancestors. Just go ahead and let me die. If you remember from the story of Elijah, there are only a couple of people in scripture that never died, that never had a, the experience of a human death here on earth. And Elijah was one of them. God didn't answer his prayer, but he gave him something better. When we think in terms of Mount Carmel and Mount Horeb, Ah, we always tend to pray for Mount Carmel. And I, I, I certainly do. That's what I want. I want to see the big things happen. I want to see the fire fall from the sky. But I need to understand that God's presence at Mount Horeb is just as crucial, just as critical. God may not answer my prayers the way I want him to, but he'll answer them. And we'll see down the road that he answered them in a way that was far better. How can we help you this morning? If we can pray with you again, message our website, let us, or our, our Facebook page, website, whatever, let us know how we can help you. If you haven't been baptized and would like to share in that, in that first step into the family of Christ, we'd love to help you with that as well. We'd love to, obviously we'll have to keep a small crowd, but we can, we can stay within the limits and we can baptize you into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and let you rise and walk in a new life, having your sins washed away and learning to follow Jesus and be one of his servants. How can we help you today? Please let us know. We're gonna sing a song here at the end to encourage you to do that. Thank you for joining with us today. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Behold our God, seated on his throne, come let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare, come let us adore him. You will reign forever. 
Come, let us adore Him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Hi, I'm Jamie Sorrells, one of the elders here at Westside, and just wanted to thank you once again for joining in to our online service this morning. Uh, we appreciate Tim and Zach and all the crew here that help us uh, put that on. It looks like it's going to be that way for a few weeks. Uh, as far as announcements, uh, we wanted to let you know that the uh, building worship or the worship services here at the building, we've had to suspend those indefinitely at this time. Uh, of course, the elders are meeting and getting together and looking at all the information that's being put out by the state and local authorities. And we will make decisions and just get you that information as soon as possible. And we appreciate your cooperation in that. Uh, we do continue to uh, encourage you to maintain your social distance as, uh, as that's the new normal now. Uh, if you're one of our older members, we ask you to stay at home if at all possible. Uh, if you're sick or, or have an immune system problem or something like that, we encourage you to just stay out of contact uh, with other individuals. We know how, how this, this disease that we've got going on right now, it's no respecter of persons. Uh, it, it will affect the young and old, and it's just spreading, and it's, it's kind of all of our personal responsibility to try to stem the tide of the spread of this disease. So uh, be diligent, uh, be smart, and try to uh, maintain your distance from those that you can, and maybe we can uh, slow this down and get back to normal just as soon as possible. We're really looking forward to uh, getting back together. Uh, with everyone here at the building and getting back to our uh, normal way of life. If you need anything, uh, call the office, call one of the elders, call one of our ministers, call someone and we will take care of it for you. It's not a problem. Uh, Monday night for the master. I know that some of the ladies have been getting together and providing those meals. Uh, we're not having our meetings, but we are going to ask you to restrict that as well. Alan and Charlie is going to handle that from this point forward, and we're still going to get some meals out to the homeless folks, but uh, we, uh, Alan, Spurlock, and Charlie are going to handle that. So we appreciate your cooperation in that. And then don't forget on uh, 6.30 on Wednesday evening, we'll have a uh, time of a little bit, uh, some more announcements uh, from here at Westside and also a short devotional. So uh, tune in to Westside Live or the Westside website and we can connect you up with that. As far as our family goes here, our prayer list, uh, one thing I need to mention, uh, Governor Hutchison has directed today or declared today as a, a, a state of, or for our state, a day of prayer. So uh, we appreciate that our leaders are looking towards the Lord for guidance and wisdom. And uh, he just asks us to pray to help unify us in our struggle and to thank God for his love and mercy as we uh, go forward with this. As far as our family here at Westside, uh, a couple of uh, things we need to note. Jim, Bob, and Betty, of course, are still at home recuperating. Uh, James, their son, is, uh, has been quarantined in a local hotel. So uh, his, his symptoms are subsiding, and hopefully he's had a test. He's going to get those results tomorrow, and hopefully he gets to go back home with his family, and that will be good. Uh, Jim Bob also mentioned that Elizabeth and their grandson Oliver are down in New Orleans, which is one of the hot spots uh, for the coronavirus, and uh, ask a special prayer for them and all the other people. We have some other uh, members with kin folks down in that area, so we need to remember them. Also, Clay Reed, uh, he got some bad news this week that the cancer has come back in his other lungs. So uh, Clay, uh, Clay has put out such a courageous fight and it uh, looks like that's going to continue for a little time more. And we certainly want to pray for Clay and Candy and their family. Helen Stevens broke her foot and uh, she's recuperating from that. Need to keep her in our prayers. Brenda Gist is uh, Jan Harrell's, one of Jan Harrell's friends. She's uh, looking at a double mastectomy operation coming up soon. So uh, need to keep her in our prayers. And Charles Sessions, uh, kind of a unique situation. He's down in Houston. He has a rare form of cancer and he has actually been sequestered into an RV park with some other cancer 
patients uh, because they're trying to open up space in the, in the hospital rooms for the COVID patients. So anyway, let's keep Charles in our prayers as well. And there's certainly some others mentioned in the bulletin. So let's uh, look after that and keep our prayer lives going, keep those prayers going up. Some great news from here at Westside. We had a couple of weddings this week. We had Dylan and Sierra Collins were married. And uh, let's see, Mason and Tori Brewer, uh, they were married as well. So let's uh, wish them very well. I'm sure they didn't get the ceremony that they were thinking about, but uh, uh, they're married nonetheless, and we're wishing them uh, years and years of happiness. We also had a new baby here at Westside. Uh, Zach and Brittany Loudon uh, uh, had... Uh, Forrest Patrick, I believe his name, right? Okay, that's it. Anyway, uh, Pat and Sherry Crosby are the proud grandparents as well as uh, Don and Linda Loudon up in Pennsylvania. So we're just happy for that entire family and what a great gift. One more, uh, one more uh, thought of gratitude is just to thank you for what you've done. Thank uh, uh, during this difficult time, uh, that West Side is going through and so many others is going through, but uh, you've realized that the work of the church is continuing. We appreciate uh, the fact that you continue giving and making that a part of your weekly routine. And we ask and encourage you to continue to do that because uh, there's so many needs here. Uh, a lot of the costs and a lot of the expenses can continue going on and we just want to be able to continue to serve the others that we do normally as well as the other ones uh, that have come our way because of this uh, coronavirus. So if you would uh, continue to do that, you can do it online. You can do it uh, off our website, I believe. You can mail a check in. I think our 2300 West C is at our... 2300 West C is our address over here at the office, or you can drop a check by as long as our office is still open. So anyway, we appreciate all you're doing in that regard. A uh, couple of uh, sad notes that we had uh, from our family here at Westside. We had some of our members pass away, and we certainly want to make note of them. You know, it's so difficult for the families, especially during this time, because they don't get to have that normal uh, grieving period in that in that funeral or the uh, memorial service. So it's very difficult for families. And we just wanted to mention, maybe if you'll, if you'll bear with me for just an extra moment, I want to mention a, a few of those uh, folks. Carla Ford, just a sweet, sweet lady. She lived right up here in the apartments uh, uh, down the street from the church. And uh, she was just uh, one of a kind. She started attending Westside a few years ago, and she was really involved in our Monday night for the master she took a special interest in the cancer patients uh, at the hospital. She suffered from cancer herself, and she really enjoyed going down there and sharing uh, the robes that we had made or the uh, snack packs that we had for the cancer patients down there. And uh, she's just a sweet, sweet lady. She had uh, uh, two children or two girls and a boy, and she had seven grandchildren that she loved very much. I uh, knew her personally. She was involved in our small group, and she uh, always asked some really, really great questions. Uh, we could answer some of those, and some of those we couldn't. But I tell you what, uh, Carla got some of the answers she was looking for in the arms of her Savior this week. So we're going to miss Carla. Darwin Price also passed away this week. Darwin's been in, and Glenad have been longtime members here at Westside for so many years, and we appreciated him so much. Uh, he was born in London, uh, went to Arkansas Tech, uh, went and served in the Korean War. He was in the Air Force, uh, came back and worked at Firestone and retired from Firestone. He was a deacon here at Westside for many, many years. He uh, was in charge of our assembly management for a long, long time. And uh, we just appreciated Darwin uh, for his steadfastness here at Westside. Many will remember him. Uh, one of his sons was tragically killed in a car accident years ago, Jim. And he established a scholarship in his name. He also lost a, a granddaughter, uh, Joan, or, uh, excuse me, Lisa. And he left uh, uh, to remember him, Glenette and uh, Joni, his daughter and his son, Randy. So we just want to uh, uh, reach out to them. He had five grandchildren and four great-grandchildren. Darwin was a great guy. We're really gonna miss him. He loved God and he loved his family. And then we had one more death that touched our family here. James Cole lost his mother uh, this week. And 
her name was Beverly. I think she went by Kay, Kay Cole. They lived in Fort Smith. I uh, was just reading about her. I didn't know uh, Sister Cole, but she was born premature. And back in those days, uh, most of those babies didn't make it. And as they were tending to her mother, uh, they heard a whimper from the child. And uh, that child lived. Uh, and I think God had a purpose for that child. And uh, she went to school there in uh, Eastern Oklahoma, married her high school sweetheart, and they both got baptized at the Tahlequah Church of Christ, her and her husband, Norman. It wasn't long after that they started their family, and they started their family with the purpose of loving God and serving God. And they laid a foundation for that. She had four children. She lost one of her uh, child children early, but she had two other daughters and her son, James. And James serves as an elder here at Westside. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, he had six, uh, she, they had six grandchildren. Of course, we know uh, James and Becca and Sarah from here at Westside. She had three others and their family uh, actually just treasured her and cherished her. She was an active member at the West Ark Church of Christ in Fort Smith. And she's going to be missed uh, tremendously by not only that congregation, but the family as well. Uh, James posted a really, really uh, touching uh, bit in, on the Facebook. In fact, I was going to uh, read a portion of it uh, this morning, but quite honestly, I, I couldn't, couldn't get through it without getting emotional. So uh, go to, go to uh, his website and read that. Very touching. The man, is, uh, he's hurt. He's missing his mama. And uh, she was a sweet lady. You know, our world is struggling right now. And... Uh, in many ways, uh, we're seeing things change. A lot of things are changing, but there's one thing that doesn't change, and that that our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, still reigns, and he's still the Savior of the world. There's no question about that. Uh, he's greater than this sickness that we're going through, and we're gonna get through on the other side. There's no question about that either. We just need to be thankful we need to have gratitude in our hearts and we need to keep looking above for God's providence and we'll get through this. If you would uh, bow with me in prayer as we close. Dear God, we feel your presence this morning. We know that we find you listening. We're so thankful that you're our God. We're thankful for the love, the mercy that you rain down on us. Lord, as our world struggles, as our world is disrupted, as our world is stricken by this sickness, God, we just ask that you can help us deal with this. Give us the confidence we need, Lord. Give us the comfort that we need. Give us the assurance that you are in control. We know you are. Lord, we ask you to provide our leaders, the leaders of our country, the leaders of our state, the leaders of our community here, Yes, and even the leaders of our church, we just ask that you give us wisdom that we need to get through this. We ask that you give us guidance. Uh, Lord, this, this uh, disease has struck in, uh, stricken us the world over, and we just ask that everyone can come together and, Lord, possibly even look more towards you, and that would be a good thing that could come out of this bad thing. Lord, we're so thankful for those that are on the front lines of this, uh, fighting this battle. Uh, the doctors, the nurses, the medical professionals, Lord, we just ask that you be with them and bless them. Uh, the essential services, Lord, that have to continue on just to keep our world rolling along. We just ask you to be with all those people. We ask you to be with those uh, that are working on a cure. We ask you to bless them with the knowledge that they need to defeat this disease. Yeah, we ask that we can all be diligent in our fight against this, Lord, and we ask that we all uh, never forget the unending grace that you give us. We're so thankful for what you do for us, Lord. We're thankful for the ones that we mentioned earlier that need uh, your comfort and care, and we're thankful for Jesus. As Tim said, uh, the calm and the storm, we just uh, know that Jesus is that calm that we're looking for. We're just so thankful that you sent him to this earth, Lord. It is in his precious name that we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us once again this morning, and we wish you God's richest blessings on you and your family.